Um, so as Sarah said, my name's Kylie. I am a copyright lawyer and a copyright researcher. And I'll be chairing the panel today, although I'll be a bit of an active chair, I guess you can call it that, because we want to very much have a discussion. So I'll be participating in, in that as well. Um, what we want to focus on in our panel today, which, which is called Perspectives on Copyright Reform, are some of the aspects of reform that haven't really been touched on yet. So, as has been alluded to a few, a few times today, throughout 2023, the Attorney General's Department ran a series of ministerial roundtables to consider some of the issues impacting Australia's copyright system. And from those roundtables, th there was broad agreement from all the stakeholders involved that there were five key areas where mutually acceptable reforms could likely be reached. Um, one of those was AI, which has been uh, talked about a lot today. We want to talk about uh, two of the others, Orphan Works and Fair Dealing for Quotation, and in particular to discuss how reform in those areas is likely to impact on Australia's public cultural institutions. So um, we're lucky today to have Erin Driscoll from the National Film and Sound Archive and Robin Van Dyke from the Australian War Memorial to give us some insights into how uh, Australia's cultural institutions are, are already grappling with some of these uh, copyright questions and how law reform is likely to impact them. So uh, we thought we'd start today just by talking a little bit more about, about your roles in these institutions. Um, titles don't always tell us exactly what a person does. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about what your role is in your, ver in your respective institutions um, and how copyright is involved in that role? I'll start. Thanks, Kylie. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of um, my role at the NFSA um, in the licensing, rights and distribution team, um, we're sort of at the coal face of doing all the, all the hard work in terms of copyright clearances, rights verification. I will admit that um, the team does all the hard work. <laughs> um, I oversee that more, more than getting my hands into it. Um, but um, I have done that previously. Um, we have a collection of four million items. We have, of which we only own 90% of, um, uh, or 10%, less than 10% of the copyright. Um, and of, um, and I'm sure we'll, um, I'll bring this up again, um, about 20, 20 to 30% is orphan works. Um, so there's a lot of work in um, research that the team undertake. Um, and then, of course, um, that's just the first step. Um, we also then have the issue of how we share and um, uh, collect, preserve and share those items. So then um, there's a lot of work involved in the strategy um, around um, the application of copyright um, and what will be the right strategy, um, which will may vary in terms of the, the various programs and projects. Um, we also have the distribution side of the team. So we have, um, I know we, I said we only own 10% of the copyright or less. Um, a, a big asset that we have um, is our Film Australia collection of 3,000 titles. Um, and that was, um, that goes from about the 1920s to the early 2000s. Um, so it was the Department of Information. There was um, a film unit and then it's had a, a various lineage um, through to um, Film Australia, that was Film Australia Limited, then um, Australian Film Commission, and then we actually had it transferred to us, which was great in 2011. Um, and so it um, is um, an amazing collection of documentary films um, and, and um, moving image items and, and still images, um, and a really a wealth of um, Australia in, 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 in film. Um, so we um, seek to 
put that in um, commercial or to commercially exploit that in terms of streaming services. We have distribution arrangements with various streamers like DotPlay, and we even have now our own streaming service, NFSA Player. So um, coming to this conversation, I want to sort of really stress that we have um, quite a complex relationship with copyright in that we are cultural and we have a statutory mandate to provide access, but we also um, are copyright owners and that um, we also um, have in our corporate plan sole source revenue generation with our Film Australia collection. So we have both hats there. Yeah. Really interesting. Thank you. I'm Robin. Yes, as uh, head of the research centre, I mainly deal with the archive and library copyright, but we don't have lawyers at the memorial in any kind of way to deal with copyright. So really it's down to curators to wend their way through the act to uh, establish access and um, you know web publication of things. Memorial is also a publisher and uh, we manage uh, various rights. Uh, the collection that I work with, the big issue for us is digitisation. Uh, it's, it's our main preventative form of conservation of the collection and it's a, our you know, main way we want to provide access. And so copyright is always intrinsically involved in that um, area and so that's probably the main kind of focus in my head when I'm here and talking about access and uh, digital preservation. Great. Um, so the, the first uh, potential area of copyright reform we want to talk about today is around orphan works. Um, and I know in this crowd um, we're very much speaking to people in the know, but uh, just in case uh, anybody is not familiar with the term. Uh, we use the term orphan work in copyright to refer to items that are still under copyright protection, but the copyright owners are unknown or cannot be found or located to get permission to use that work. So copyright in general lasts for a, a really long time, life of the creator plus 70 years. So often, as you can imagine, in that 100, 150 years, um, records get lost, companies get bought out, go bankrupt, etc. And we kind of lose that chain of, of who owns the copyright in that particular item. Uh, unfortunately, under our current copyright law, the law is, is strict in that if you don't have permission and you don't have a legal exception you can rely on, then you can't use the work. So orphan works fall into this sort of grey area where you, you can't ask permission because you don't know who to ask permission from, which means you can't use the work. It, it just sort of languishes for decades until we can safely assume that the copyright has expired. Um, so there is a pro there's a proposal to, or at least you know, discussions about about freeing up some of these the access to orphan works, so that if a copyright owner cannot be found um, after a diligent search, then under particular circumstances, people might be able to use share orphan works. Um, so orphan works is uh, they're a problem that have, have been around for a long time in this country. Um, and I wanted to ask our panel members in particular, so we might start with Erin again, um, what's the role of Orphan Works at your institution? Are, are they a problem for the NFSA? How does the NFSA deal with that? Yeah, thanks, Kylie. Um, they're a significant problem, as I was mentioning before, um, like of, of the material that's in copyright being 90% of the 4 million works, um, 20, around 20 to 30% um, we estimate is orphaned. Um, so they're a significant problem um, in because of the nature of, um, or in particular because of the nature of AV copyright. So um, there is published audiovisual, sound recordings, uh, music publishers, um, there's films that have been um, 
produced with um, government funding and th that chain of title is clearer, um, but as you alluded to, um, you know, often there's multiple rights holders, so you have own joint ownership issues. Sometimes the investors' rights um, will revert to um, producers and production companies from the film funding bodies and the investors after a certain time. So you have issues around tracking the whole documentation um, with, with titles. So that's just part of the collection. But of course, we have um, home movies. Um, we have um, memorabilia items that, um, that relate to, to significant works. Um, we might have fan letters um, from, you know, uh, we had an exhibition on T Simon Townsend, um, Wonderworld, um, and the significant role that played in children's television. But um, we had all this um, e ephemeral items that had, and uh, memorabilia that um, fans had, had um, you know, um, or donated through various donations and, and so forth. So then uh, you might have it by a child's first name and you might not have, you know, details of that. Um, so, uh, so in addition to the type of work, um, it, it's also the issue that our database, as much as, um, you know, we want it to be, um, have high integrity um, and to be accurate, it, it is a database that is dynamic and over time um, it's added to and corrected. So part of um, the members of my team, they do an awesome job um, as soon as they've done their research and there's a new contact, copyright contact identified that the database will be updated. We have notes fields, we attach agreements and so forth and it's sort of um, got a rights module. But it's only um, as accurate as the information was at the time. So at the time of collection, um, it, it might have been a formal donation, um, it, it might have uh, come in from someone that wasn't the rights holder. You can donate without copyright. You can donate with copyright. So, um, you know, the actual provenance um, and history behind that can really affect um, what, what information you have. So um, that's a, a massive problem. Um, and over time, things will improve, um, but it will take time. Um, so, yes, yeah, so... Uh, and then, then the... Um, other issue is that with, um, as well as um, the provenance and the, the chain of title problems, um, we also have uh, difficulties um, with how, how we provide orphans to, to our clients. Um, and we have a lot of requests for, from third parties, such as documentary filmmakers, film societies and, and the like. Um, so um, probably can talk about that a little bit later, but um, yeah. So it's, yeah, we might get into yeah, that next. Not just our, yeah. our use, but um, third party use as well. Yeah, exactly. And at the War Memorial? Yes. We've <laughs> probably got thousands of orphan works already on our website, and we've got more in the collection ready to at some point go. Um, Orphan, works can get orphaned very quickly and it, for pre-email days um, all it takes is an address move and then the contact is lost. And so uh, I think it's only in about the last maybe 15 years that the memorial actually sought to um, deal with copyright at, a, at the donation process. So we have about 15,000 collections, and by collection I mean somebody's body of work, their letters and their diaries from their war um, years. Uh, we've got about 15,000 of those in the collection, and um, within those, a huge majority <coughs> are orphan works, but also within those collections there's a multitude of third party works within those. And I think, um, you know, we, we heavily rely on Section 200AB of the Copyright Act. Without that, our digitisation program would be dead in the water. And um, I think our first precedent for publishing orphan works um, was third-party works in a particular collection. So, um, yes, it's... The other thing is, I'll just add, is that digitisation maybe 10 years ago was not that big but every year there's higher demand governments are funding digitization it's considered fundamentally important so what was once 
a big job is now an even bigger job. So the, the, my last thing about orphan works is they're a labour soak. Even with 200 AB, even with um, sort of a bit better knowledge, they take quite a bit of time and resources. And I think part of my reason for coming here is to talk a little bit about um, how fair that is for a cultural institution to spend its time on these collections, you know, what's that balance? How much time should we be spend? It's all taxpayers' money in the end, you know, we're all... Um, Digitisation is eye-wateringly expensive. It is beyond anything you've ever paid for when you've ordered a copy. It, we worked it out and it's um, close to $2,000 for one wallet of a private record, so one, one part of a collection to digitise and put it on the web and then manage its digital life into the future. And that would include things like conservation and everything. So digitisation is expensive. Um, we are looking after people's collections into the future. But there has to be some payoff for that. And perhaps it's, uh, yeah. All right, so let's, let's dig into that because that's uh, really interesting, I think. So particularly when, when we're dealing with uh, cultural institutions, right? Part of your mandate is preservation, um, curation, sharing with the public, educating the public. Um, so under, so with Orphan Works, right? Part of it is about trying to make that available to the public. Um, Section 200 AB of the Copyright Act. Robin mentioned that. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, that is a, a section of the Copyright Act. Uh, notoriously uh, vague and problematic section, but one that basically it applies to libraries, archives, educational institutions, and it permits uh, a use to be made of a work where the use doesn't conflict with the normal exploitation of that work and doesn't unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of a copyright owner. So, super fun to interpret at an institutional level, but has also been relied upon uh, by many cultural institutions to try to deal with the orphan works problem. So, in um, some of our pre-discussions for this panel, um, both Erin and Robin shared with me some, some examples and case studies of, of orphan works that they have taken through this process of um, trying to figure out how to make them available under Section 200 AB. Um, and I would love for you to kind of talk a bit about that now, about the process that's involved, the labour that's involved, um, how you make the decisions about, about what, what to do and when and how. Um, so do you want to start with your case study? Yeah, yeah sure. So um, just in terms of um, the general process for Orphan Works, we fit uh, across the board we have a two-step process. So we have um, assessing that it's orphaned and, and verifying and documenting um, the, the reasonably diligent search process. Um, and obviously that helps with risk mitigation, but it's, um, it also um, provides longevity of that research into the future because um, it, with this Orphan Works assessment sheet, it has all these little tick boxes. How did you do your search? I looked at the records. I, I um, you know, did Facebook. I did online. I tried a collecting society. I tried ASIC. Um, what's the... Um, and then you go through various other steps um, uh, and then that's signed off and then it's deemed orphan into the future. And I feel like that's a really important point to make because we've, um, over the 10 years since we started this documentation, we've um, deemed 3,000 uh, 3, titles orphaned. So over, on average, that's only 300 a year um, with you know, uh, about three in the team that are working on that and at various times there's been fewer resources and, and other times more. But that just shows, and um, and obviously an orphan opportunity needs to come up, but over on an annual basis only 300, but we have the collection of 4 million. So go figure how many more years till we <laughs> um, got to the bottom of that. But um, yeah, so we have that. And then if we want to use it, we have another process where um, then we have to um, document the use, which will align with um, 
if it does fall within 200 AB, all the statutory requirements. Um, so um, usually we try and work backwards because special case is always a little bit amorphous um, and then it's often that it's um, for a particular purpose um, and it's a certain purpose. But we also need to document um, that we're not prejudicing the, the copyright owner's interests, um, as well as the question, is there another exception and is there a, a licence available? And then we will look at things such as donor restrictions, ICIP and other things like that. So um, a good example of like a, a really, um, you know, non-controversial application of 200 AB. So we do use it in exhibitions on site and we are increasingly using it in online because we have um, a digital first policy, as with many other culturals. Um, and, um, th and that's the main way we're going into the future, like digital exhibitions and so forth. And that's in response to um, user, user demands and, and interests and people wanting to have a more sort of experiential um, um, engagement with collections. So we had um, Burley glass slides. So I'm not sure if you all know what a glass slide is, but it was like um, painted on a piece of glass and then that was projected onto um, in old, in, for cinema screenings. Um, and that was the advertisements before the films. So for um, women's foundational garments, there were all many beautiful glass slides. <laughs> um, and Burley said, they're not ours. And we don't, well, we don't think they're ours because it was from the 20s and 30s. And we're not prepared to do the work um, and to verify that. But we fully support you using it, but it's not our copyright. So obviously, um, we wanted to um, have an exhibition of, of, of glass slides and from, um, you know, the experience of um, attending the theatre of the day and the sort of social um, mores around gender stereotyping and so forth. Um, and so we did use uh, quite a large collection. So that was sort of an easy win. Um, sometimes um, we, we, we um, if it's a commercial use, um, by um, ourselves or a third party, we, we may not um, obviously apply 200 AB if we can seek a licence. So when you say, Erin, that there's a, there's a bit of a tick sheet, you go through the process, etc., do you have a sense of, on average, how many hours, days, etc., that process takes? That's a great question. So there's not a science to, to orphan work searches. Um, so I feel like at the NFSA we do do a um, very diligent search, but it has to be reasonable. And so that is a tricky question, what is reasonable and how long is a piece of string? Um, and also it's all about lines of inquiry. So sometimes it's really clear, like sometimes we've got collection items where the people had no children, okay, and it was... Um, a creator's work and it wasn't published. So you sort of, what, what are your lines of inquiry? And we, we know who it was, um, we know their death date, but we, can't ha have, we don't have an address. And these days, people's phone numbers and so forth, it goes to mobiles. Mm -hmm. So some of that old data is, is now not as relevant. But then you may have something else that has many, many threads for lines of inquiry. Um, Sometimes um, my, my team tell me um, that, you know, I found, um, I, we, we somehow fell upon this copyright owner in a really haphazard manner. Um, and it was luck in a way. So, for example, um, there was a copyright dispute and you, there was a, you know, um, copyright tri tribunal or federal, federal court. And it's like, oh my goodness, there, there, there's this information. And so that was just a, a Google search and up comes something. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's not a, a pure science. Um, and so it's really, really hard to sort of say what the time estimate. Um, but you have to wait as well. Like, it's not as though um, you start this today, I'm going to come to the solution of this orphan work. It can um, extend over a week and extend over a month. So, so While you wait for people to get back, back to you. you. Yeah. Great. Robin? Yeah, we have a similar tick sheet, and I think our collection, um, this is pretty much around our private records collection, I think it's got a more uniform 
ways to look. I mean, Ancestry and Google and, and a few diligent searches like that. And then um, our proce process is really to, if, we, if nothing turns up, we do a blog post where we describe who the person is and seeking information. And that's our final phase. And that's, um, I think that comes from uh, the old exception, publishing old works in libraries and archives, I think sort of pulled out, because it used to be, you know, you'd publish in the Gazette, an intent to publish. So it, I think it, we, we borrowed it for that and then included it in our 200 AB process. So it's documented. We, we take the blog down after a certain amount of time as well. Do you get many people approach you um, in response to a blog post? I, I was surprised that we do find the occasional person, but we um, very rarely, um, years ago we used to get more, like about 99% um, yes, 1% no, about maybe um, 10 years ago, but now it's um, rare, extremely rare for somebody to say no. Usually it's excitement and they often didn't even know the item was in the collection, so it's, a, it's usually a very positive experience. Um, yeah, so that's a time thing as well because you've got to wait for the blog to do its thing. I think we used to have it at three months and we've shortened it now to maybe six weeks or four weeks, I can't remember. But anyway, we shortened the time um, period as well because what we're doing with 200AB is getting comfortable in it, knowing how to lean into certain areas and stretch it in areas that work for us and where we see no issues. So things like three months seemed reasonable 10 years ago when you were publishing, but now that fit, that is too long for our business to get material out and it didn't change anything. So just experimenting with things and, and sort of changing how we do it. Mm. So when we're talking about orphan works reform, what we're normally talking about is a, a limited liability scheme, right? That if um, a person does a diligent search for the copyright owner and still cannot find the copyright owner, then uh, they can use the work. Um, whether that looks like, you know, a, a small payment into a fund in case the copyright owner emerges, whether that looks like uh, an exception to infringement for that period, you know, that, that's sort of debated. But, but that is, in general, what it would be. A diligent search and then still no copyright owner, you can use the work. Um, that would be of benefit, definitely, to individuals who want to use um, orphan works or uh, any commercial organisations, say, that are, are not covered by Section 200 AB. But I wanted to ask both of you, given that Section 200 AB does exist, that cultural organisations are using it to navigate the orphan works problem, would a limited liability scheme for orphan works make any difference to you? Would it actually help? Um, and maybe, maybe that would depend on what it would look like, and if so, perhaps you can comment on that. Um, I think it would be, um, I think it's still needed despite um, 200 AB because I think it um, is um, a further safeguard measure um, in an environment where, um, you know, traditionally, as we've all heard before, and we can honestly say this was the case, um, quite risk averse, where, as um, Robin said, we're um, feeling our way, testing the boundaries. But we have to remember um, the, the risk aversion came from the fact that we're custodians of cultural heritage. Um, and, you know, obviously we have our risks with copyright infringement, but we have um, reputational damage. There's other rights issues such as con contractual restrictions, ICIP. So that's sort of um, the context in, in which um, we're operating with 200 AB. So um, 200 AB definitely provides flexibility. But with Orphan Works, um, it's important to understand that um, sharing of cultural heritage and provision of access doesn't stop at the institution walls. Um, and it's the public who are engaging with us. Um, some An institution such as the NFSA, we're an industry archive. Um, we um, have a wealth, a, a wealth of um, culture that is being um, 
used by documentary filmmakers, researchers and so forth. And um, what we're finding is that the third parties are quite reluctant to use orphan works. We feel that we can re rely on 200 AB um, because of the subsection that says um, providing services of a kind um, or, or of a kind ordinarily provided by the institution. So we provide reference services and supply to third parties. So we feel we are covered, but what's happening is documentary filmmakers, especially um, independent um, um, filmmakers, are really reluctant to use the orphan work um, because we um, are passing the risk to them through our agreements. We're asking them to indemnify us uh, because we have concerns about authorisation and um, liability. Uh, and then we also have issues um, with our insurance because we are covered, but um, you know, to actively breach the, um, you know, the Copyright Act, um, but we may be covered by 200 AB, but there's issues and concerns around that. Um, and the other thing is some of these filmmakers, let's say they are funded, um, or other creatives, I keep focusing on film, but, but broader, broader users, um, Anecdotally, we understand that uh, film funding agreements and, and funding arrangements require them to warrant that they have no concerns with IP and so forth. So they're reluctant to use the material. And the thing is, some of this material is primary source material. It may, it, it's like the link to, um, you know, um, the, a, a, histor a historical reference material that may be um, integral to truth telling of whatever you're trying to um, portray in, in your new creative work. So it's um, reducing access to the historical record if um, these third parties are reluctant to use material because of the concern that they're infringing downstream infringement of copyright because it's an orphan. Um, and then the second um, example would be in relation to um, quasi-commercial activities by the institution. So um, I have two examples. We just released um, a six-part podcast on um, the history of uh, radio, the 100 years of radio in Australia, called um, it's uh, Who Listens to the Radio? Um, and it was, um, yeah, it was our Radio 100 project. So because we were operating in the space of podcasts, and it's the first podcast we've created, we were quite cautious around rights. We did have one or two orphan works. We did go ahead with using them, but um, to provide to these third party platforms, again, you have to be able to warrant that there's no concerns with underlying rights clearances. So, you know, um, we could say that's 200 AB, um, but rightly so, um, creator groups may consider that that we're operating in a, a commercial space, especially, um, you know, given that platforms, there'll be indirect benefits from the uh, platforms are deriving from, from um, in terms of monetization around advertising. Um, our podcast is fee free, um, but yeah. So this is where we're heading because there's demand from, um, for the experiential consumption of um, cultural heritage. Someone wants to listen to the story of last 100 years of radio while they're walking their dog. Um, and yes, and, um, and also to be able to engage with our website interactively from home and so forth. Yeah, I agree. It, um, 200 AB stops at the museum or archive or library's door and then the end user really doesn't have anywhere to go or any form of protection. So I definitely think there's a place for it there. And for those things like collection books, um, brochures that, that we sell and um, that where, where the museum or archive and library ends up in a commercial area. Um, for the museum, archive and library itself though, I will say for the memorial, we've been using 200 AB for 15 years and we have not had one single issue. No takedown requests, no issues. So, you know, there's a thing in copyright where there's a catastrophizing somewhere at this end, um, but the reality is somewhere over here. And I think we just, the next step 
is to look at this end user and making sure that the collections are used to the best um, um, way that we can make them be used. Great. So I have one last question about Orphan Works before we move on to quotation. Um, and I might start with you, Robin. So I think one of the one of the big messages is around the enormous amount of labour and time that goes into managing Orphan Works. That per perhaps the risk is not as as big as we might perceive, but there's still quite a lot of labour involved. Um, so my question is, do you see opportunities that aren't already being exploited for uh, glam sector organisations to, to work together around orphan works to minimise some of that labour or risk? It's the advocating for the user where this really, the, the issue of quotation comes to mind for me because we, you know, people write a book and they've got quotes all through it without realising copyright. It, and then you get the call, you know, it's about to go to publish, how do I find these people, oh dear, they're orphan works. And nobody, no publisher is taking the risk on quotation currently. So I know when, when the memorial published its collection book a few years ago, um, for quotation, the publisher would only take three words in a row as a quote. So then you're going trawling back through trying to find it or you're paraphrasing. In my mind, I really don't see how you can monetize quotation anyway. It's a kind of citation, yes, but what's to be gained? It's just a lot of labor in creating new works. I mean, obviously there can be some limitation in size around it, but um, yeah, I, I see quotation as an area that can help our digital economy in some way and help our creative economy um, if we can somehow get past three letters in a row, three words in a row. <laughs> so the background context here is uh, the there are discussions around a potential new fair dealing exception for quotation, which uh, Australia is pretty much an outlier internationally in not having some sort of exception for quotation. We have an exception for research or study, uh, parody or satire, reporting the news, criticism or review, other sort of main ones. Um, but nothing just, just to quote, um, which ends up being, as Robin was saying, a kind of uh, a complex area where many copyright lawyers like myself might say that many quotes are de minimis, are, are not substantial enough to require payment. But because there is an aversion to risk, our publishers in particular will want permission, will want licensing um, of those quotes. And when you have a work that involves many quotes, um, whether that's a book, whether that's a documentary film, then uh, this can get very expensive very quickly. So the proposal is for an exception for quotation. Um, so yeah, Erin, did you want to want to talk about is quotation something that the NFSA would be interested in or or, or use, or, and what would what do you think about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we already um, to an extent rely on uh, fair dealing for criticism, review, and, and news reporting in terms of um, making use of excerpts of collection materials. Um, so obviously. Um, Criticism review, we rely on very, very heavily um, for online exhibitions and in exhibitions, use on social media. Um, but the issue with, with that is that we have to fulfil the criteria of criticism review, like um, evaluating um, the quality or character of, of the work or its significance um, it, in, in the content. Um, so it, it sort of changes the way you curate, um, which which curators have been um, very amenable to. But the the fact is, it's within um, the confines of critique or evaluation. 
Um, but And these days, as I mentioned before, we have this digital first policy um, and users want to see collection items on social media, for example, um, and some of that media mediums do not allow for, um, you know, um, curatorial notes around them. Um, so they want the image or um, a quick short excerpt. Um, so, so it would very, be very helpful in terms of being able to legally quote, um, because often we'll say, no, that's not criticism review, no, you can't use it that way. Um, and then we do rely on news reporting. A lot of people think, well, you're not a news organisation, but um, if you re read the fine text of the provision, um, it's not based on the news media organisations, it's based on um, the newsworthiness of the information. So we use it for obituaries, um, and if we're the first to uh, say, here's our collection highlights from 2023, um, and then um, news, news organisations will come and refer back to our website. So it's a limited use, um, but we definitely benefit from using um, quotation in uh, more experiential um, engagement with the collection, um, and also for our use on our collections database. So at the moment, our um, the public, our researchers, um, actually have to come on site um, to one of our three offices or a state library and view and, um, and preview collection material. Uh, whereas what we would like to do is to have um, collection material available on our database for, to be, um, and have far greater accessibility um, for anyone, anywhere. Um, and I was just wanting to close the loop on your earlier question about um, what can we do within the sector yeah. around orphan works. And I feel like there is a place also for around quotation, um, should, should an um, fair dealing exception be extended to quotation, is that that would be a really good place um, as to, to, you know, three words? Is it more than three words? Um, because there's a lot of, lot of debate as to what is the definition of a quote. Um, and um, and then, as you said, Kylie, de minimis use, um, potentially. Um, and then we also have to go the fairness of the use because in its cultural heritage artefacts and, you know, um, as, um, uh, as we heard earlier today from one of the Canadian cases, the copyright balance is, you know, the balance between disseminating um, information um, and knowledge and the outputs of cultural expression and artistic expression against um, copyright owners' interests um, in rem a remunerable use. And I feel like in the space we're in, that, um, you know, achieving the, the, a fair balance may be that we need to be able to quote um, more than... It, our, our use of a quote might be a different type of use compared to someone else in the public making a similar use of a quote. So I just sort of feel like guidelines could be applicable across both orphan works um, and also quotation. Yeah, because it's not always the size of the thing. It could be the most important little part of something, but these things can be defined and I guess um, it needs to be much more open than it is in, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say also, um, we have best practice in how we quote already. Like, I sort of feel like, um, you know, sometimes we might not think it's um, ethically appropriate because um, we have our ethical antenna up around fairness as much as our legal one. Um, and there's other considerations that then um, sort of will be stop gaps that will end up being relevant to the legal application of copyright. Um. I think that's an important point and we might, before we go to audience questions, sort of close off with a bit of a discussion around fairness and, and what that means to us. Um, my, my personal view is that we could, uh, the exceptions are fair dealing exceptions and we could give the word fair a little, a little bit more to do with these exceptions. Um, you know, it became dangerous territory for a little while when we were all debating fair use. Um, but the word fair still is in fair dealing. Uh, and I think that can be where a lot of concerns can be addressed around commercial or non-commercial use, how long the quotation is, you know, 
that sort of thing because I know that last year, for example, there were discussions around the ways in which a quotation exception might be limited um, to things like non-commercial quotation. Um, but I think, I think we can give FAIR something to do in, the, in these exceptions. And um, I'd love to sort of hear your opinions about, about fairness, how we figure that out, how that, you know, the ethics, how that comes into it, how you deal with it in your organisation. Well, I just sort of did touch upon it earlier in that sense that these collections are managed, looked after and paid for really by our taxes. And they're, they're, they're generally for the purpose of being used and that is especially, I would say, the War Memorials Collection documented all the way through in our collecting, which is, you know, to be used by Australians into the future and for research, for uh, writing histories and things like that. So they're paid for, uh, for, for by Australia. Their ongoing posterity is, is looked after and that's the assurance you get by putting the object into a cultural institution. But there does have to be a fairer use out of that material um, more broadly because, as we've already touched on, the exceptions we have tend to be for the archive and library and museum, but not for the end user. And so there has to be something that helps leap out and get people using this material more and appreciating it. And so the other thing for, Erin has sort of said this as well, we are very careful custodians of this material and it doesn't just end at copyright anyway, you know. We have very modern material, the memorial does in its collections and before we would publish that online, we have the copyright, but as a courtesy to the person, we ask, you know, is it okay? So there's an ongoing relationship with um, donors. There's an ongoing relationship with the material in the collection. And I think that's all lost in bigger business of copyright, commercial entities. I think museums and the use of those collections in the museums are a separate issue to material um, held by and and created by commercial business. And that's where I think the big divide is. And, we, uh, and I think 200 AB is the start of that um, being an exception for libraries and archives. It just stopped too short. And I think it is just that thing of that use of cultural material needs much more uh, support from government through legislation to be able to be used. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no. Totally endorse everything Robin said. Um, yeah, um, just on in terms of the fairness factors, I feel like so you've got your four factors in Australia. Hope I'm right. We've got more in the US. Um, so I feel like it's important um, to appreciate that some of the factors and the weightings in a, a cultural um, institution context, um, they're not always going to be weighted evenly. Um, and that there's a public interest imperative for some of um, behind behind this weighing process to allow for some weightings to have precedence over others. So if we work from um, does it impact um, on the commercial market or is there a um, commercial market? So sometimes we're quite cautious because. Um, we can say, well, there is the potential to, to re, republish something that's old. There's always that potential. And sometimes when something's exhibited um, or made available, um, like an excerpt, um, we may put a link. Um, if there is a market, we'll put a link to there. So we're actually encouraging uh, downstream commercial um, use um, if, if uh, 
a member of the public says, um, that was really great, that clip, I want to see the whole film or, or listen to the sound recording or whatever. So, um, you know, sometimes um, we're in, there's an indirect benefit, but just because there is the potential market doesn't mean that that um, criteria should trump the others. And I feel like um, the first factor, I think, is, or, um, is the purpose of the use. And I feel like in a cultural institution context, that is, um, you know, that should have significant weight. Um, and we know that, but it's just um, in terms of having the confidence to apply that. And then obviously there is how much you're using. Um, and then for the most part, um, we, we're not using the whole work and so forth. So it's just sort of, um, I feel like if, um, you know, there is scope, but I feel like there's scope through um, potential reform to, to sort of um, play around with the fairness factors in different contexts or through explanatory memorandum if there were to be reform. Um, I think the other thing with 200 AB I just wanted to say um, is, um, as we've many in the sector have said the limitation um, if, uh, you know, is there an existing licence or is it a special case? And I know there's a reason why it was drafted because of the three-step test and the like, but um, the special case is always quite tricky, but mostly we can find most of our uses as special. But if there's a licence, um, again, it goes to my point I've just made, just because there's the potential um, for it to be... To be um, you know, a remunerable use at some point in the future um, um, or, you know, like in the podcast example, someone might want to create a podcast um, of radio broadcasts from the 40s. They're awesome, these um, radio serials. Um, but, you know, some... Um, so there's always that potential. But um, the, the issue is um, that we, we may need to have um, a fair dealing exception for cultural institutions rather than just... Um, of 200 AB. So I feel like um, at the moment we're pretty close to the exceptions allowing us to fulfil our statutory remits, um, but the statutory remits are now at more in a modern context of a digital first um, agenda. Um, and I feel like um, maybe we there is scope and um, I know that previous reports like the ALRC recommended fair dealing for um, cultural institution use or you could be even more particular um, and that, you know, that, that might solve some of these issues um, around some of the limitations of 200 AB. I'm just going to say that's a great point about waiting. That's not something I'd thought about, but it is worth considering, say, for example, the preservation of the object might be the biggest weight and the means to do that is to use it in a way and um, whether it has a commercial application or not might not yeah so there's a justification in there but it's a it's a really good point yeah never used it like that <laughs> okay thank you um thank you to the audience too for bearing with us i know we've been in the afternoon slump period um,